This is a good book. I think it's a very good book. But, um, well, before I put it away, look at the title. The God Delusion. Now, what are the implications of the title of that book? People who believe in God are deluded. What do we do with people who suffer from delusions? Well, what, we, what the title essentially implies is that uh, people who um, say that they believe in God are essentially defective somehow. Now, when we say that someone is defective, we can sort of say, okay, I'll just, I just won't listen to what they have to say because, you know, they've got a little bit of uh, room to rant upstairs. Um, or there are those who would say, well, the best thing to do with people who are deluded is to correct them, <laughs> is to undelude them. And the third uh, way of looking at it is these delusions are dangerous. And in the age of post-9-11, uh, a lot of people out there have come to the conclusion that the God delusion is indeed extremely dangerous, or I should say God delusion, because it's unclear whether or not anyone um, who says that they believe in God is suffering from any delusions at all, because, well, we're going to have to come to a common consensus on what constitutes a delusion, aren't we? Um, and essentially, my opinion is, anyone who says things like delusion, saying that I'm seeing things correctly and you're deluded, is simply saying that my metaphor is better than your metaphor, and um, your metaphor has to be corrected. Or I shouldn't really say that your metaphor has to be corrected, but it's essentially saying my metaphor is better than your metaphor. I think we all do that. There's really no way around that. But Mr. Dawkins argues this case um, in such a way... Uh, he's essentially, I think, a nice guy. Um, he argues his case in such a way that implies that um, anyone who says that they believe in God is something of a menace. All right, I, I, I think that we're all entitled to do that, entitled to say that I believe that certain ideas are dangerous. I don't have really an issue with that. Um, but I'm not blind to the implications. So I say, okay, I understand where you're going with this, Mr. Dawkins, and I see what you're doing, and I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Because at every point when I read something, I have to decide whether or not I'm going to give someone the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to have to say, okay, is this person promoting something that, uh, that or is this person trying to be nasty? Is this person trying to be denunciatory or whatever? The usual... Um, case of that is um, how a lot of good, decent, uh, honest, and um, thoughtful religious people are now trying to deal with the moral revolution, or I guess the ethical revolution, or perhaps just the sexual revolution. I know a lot of Christians, a lot of practicing Christians, who are casting about, uh, generally with some degree of success, um, for some way to come to terms with uh, modern society's moral shift on ideas like homosexuality. A lot of Christians uh, have come to the conclusion that, you know, kind of the way that we used to think about this issue is kind of sinful, really. It's, it's, uh, we really shouldn't have, have been so harsh with, with gays. And, um, really, at the end of the day, uh, judge not lest ye be judged, um, wins out. It's, it's not up to me to decide. Uh, it may be a sin, it may not be a sin, but in the meantime, I let God do the judgment, and I, I live in this world, and, and God says, love as I have loved, etc., etc. That kind of Christian I can deal with. Um, in fact, I would probably say that most Christians that I have come into contact with are of that ilk, but that's probably simply because I avoid the loonies that just decide that they're going to cast stones regardless of whether or not they've got sins of their own to account for. Um... So there are people who are sort of dogmatic, like Dawkins or the soft Christians, um, who sort of are dogma dogmatic people that you think that you can sort of deal with. Then there's the denunciatory types. Um, the obvious example of that is the um, fundamentalist Bible-thumping preacher. Uh, they're most common, as far as I know, in... Um, uh, 
the fundamentalist Protestant sects in the United States and Canada and in uh, Northern Ireland in the UK. Uh, these guys just don't seem very nice at all. They just seem to want to say, you horrible people, uh, God's wrath will descend upon you. And all that they ever seem to do is talk about how horrible uh, the sins are. In fact, um, the love thing seems to have completely escaped them. They don't really seem to think about this. Again, uh, the chick tracts sort of underscore that. Um, but again, I mentioned Protestantism, but I come from the Catholic tradition and there is un an unbelievable amount of that in the Catholic tradition, which I'm familiar with. It's just uh, the the um, the denunciation that takes place in the ca Catholic tradition tends to be more of a more sophisticated mind game, um, and it's just as bad, though, if not possibly worse than the Protestant variation. But what I'm talking about here is denunciation and the idea that an, that an idea can itself be dangerous. There's an atheist variant of that, the atheist variant of the Old Testament prophet who all he ever does is thunder about how evil everybody else is, even though he's supposedly God's representative and God is essentially good or whatever. Uh, he's standing up for morality and rightness in the world. Um, the uh, example, I suppose, that one is most familiar with here on YouTube, at least in the community that I move in, uh, is that... Um, that American guy with the with the hair, um, who just, uh, you fucking bastards, I hope that you fucking get cancer, uh, you piece of shit, fuck! You know, that guy, with, uh, it's kind of got the eyes, you know. Um, that person, uh, in a men, a men, a men, a men, a men, a men, something like that, he's, um, he's, he goes at people with all the fire and indignation and denunciatory rhetoric of the fieriest Old Testament prophet. Um, and uh, I really don't see him as any different, or people, like, he's an extreme case, granted, um, but um, there are people out there uh, from, um, that, that are varying shades of this denunciatory uh, type of skeptic or atheist or whatever. There's, again, from Dawkins all the way over to um, uh, Mr. Hare and Mr. Eyes. Um, they, um, there's denunciation light, which I think I can live with, and then there's denunciation harsh, because I think that if, if people who thought like Dawkins had the ability to actually put their ideas into practice, I don't think that the world would really be any different from the way that it is now. Uh, the laws against religion might be tightened up or whatever, but I don't really... Or the laws against religious interference, I suppose, might be tightened up, and we would see a much more secular state along the lines of the French model. I don't think I'd have a problem with that. Uh, if the, you know, ideas of um, Mr. Scraggly Hair came into uh, practice, well, I think we'd see <laughs> some pretty powerful changes um, in the nature of reality. I think that we would see a lot more suffering. <laughs> I think that we'd see a lot more coercion. Um, now, I admit that I'm dealing with an extreme case here, but what I'm talking about is the motive force behind um, the whole idea of denunciation per se, of indignation per se, when it comes to philosophy, when it comes to ideas. How do you do, how do you deal with people uh, who not only have ideas that you might consider um, wrong, but also somehow dangerous or subversive. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, my answer to that is, this is nowhere near as dangerous as someone might think. This idea of talking... Um, skeptically about absolutely everything because it's not weakening science, it's not weakening anything. For the simple reason that we live in a society where um, where people are more anesthetized to radical discourse than ever before. Increasingly in our civilization you can talk about anything. I mentioned yesterday the Islamic world where they're running into problems because everything was always just silenced and nobody ever talked about anything other than how wonderful it is and how merciful God is. Uh, sort of a Ned Flanders world with teeth. 
But we now live in a world where anyone can talk about anything, and the revolution hasn't happened. All the terrible things that were supposed to happen when um, blacks got the vote, or when um, gays got uh, the right to marry, or when um, women got the vote, or whatever, even when people without property got the vote, have not happened. Why? Modern mass culture, for all its revolting idiocies, um, is far more of a tool of social enforcement, and I don't even think there's any there's any desire behind this tool. I don't think anyone is actually deliberately manipulating society using Keeping Up with the Kardashians, reality TV, or anything like this. I think that's just what people want. People are, are anesthetized to the point where when you say something like, um, I don't believe in scientific axioms, or I'm not really sure that uh, scientific axioms are something that we should rely on, it just goes in one ear, comes out the other, and people just ignore it. That is, um, that's the kind of uh, idea-proofing that dictators wish they had. Um, I think that our society is more idea-proof than any other society in human history, simply because there are so many things out there to distract everybody. What, what's the purpose of watching a guy like me beak off about uh, the fact that uh, science might not be the be-all and end-all of anything, when there's all kinds of interesting stuff on the boob tube over there, or the internet, or whatever. There's all kinds of things to distract us. I think it's safer now than it's ever been in terms of social disruption to talk about anything and to question anything. The only people I think that are likely to sort of see this kind of thing as a modern day version of thought crime are people that require an ism. People require um, a basic belief set to make sense of reality or else they're hopelessly at sea. I think people like that, as I say, had best sort of not get into this subject. And if they get into it, and it's dangerous or toxic to them, um, well, it's a pity. Um, you really shouldn't have. You should have walked over to the TV and turned on a nice documentary that is not going to sort of rattle you. Be careful of letting your your ideas get rattled. Um, it can be the most disorienting and terrifying thing imaginable. And if that's a call for humility, yes, and it's also a call for humili humility in my, idea, in my um, opinion with other people. You think that it's fun to walk up and tell some um, Muslim that his religion is a pile of rubbish. Do you really want to do that to another human being, to rattle that person to that extent? Um, it's, I would say that having your faith jarred to that extent is up there with existential crisis stuff, existential crisis level um, psychological dislocation. Um, I would only ask that people who find that any ideas, especially ideas that I uh, promulgate are subversive in any way, just consider the source. I'm some guy in the middle of nowhere talking about uh, you know, ludicrously unimportant and boring and egghead things in front of a webcam. I have no way of competing uh, with reality TV. Thank you.